The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, uh, good morning, uh, and good somewhere in between if you're kind of between those times. But uh, welcome to webinar number three of our uh, Asset Management Awareness Month series and Fleet Management Awareness Month series of presentations. Today, I'm happy to welcome in, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Scott Ray. I am the VP of Events and Seminars. And today, I'm happy to welcome um, Mr. Eric Brown, Sr., Department of Homeland Security, to talk about a fleet, I believe, electric vehicles and, uh, and how to monitor them, I think, in, in the, from a fleet Fine perspective. Um, so, Eric, welcome in. I thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to put together the presentation. I'm excited to hear and learn all about this, and uh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Can you hear me, Scott? I can. Perfect. Yes, sir. Perfect. So, uh, for everyone's education and the purpose of this, uh, we're going to talk about fleet electrification on how we did it here at Homeland Security. You know, we were not fully uh, electrified at this point, but we're working on it. You know, we, we started this effort back in January of 2020. I kicked it off to, to my leadership um, with the goal of electrifying 5% of the fleet. And we'll get into the numbers here shortly. Um, and, and he told me, you know, go big or go home. So we elected to do 50% of the fleet. Um, this was, this whole program was actually started long before the Presidential Executive Order 14057, which came out in December of 2021, uh, and then Section 204, where it talks about transitioning to electric vehicles, where uh, by 2027, all acquisitions of federal electric vehicles must be, or all vehicles must be electric versus internal combustion engine at that point. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off the slides. Of course, uh, as, as they've indicated, uh, you know, you guys hold your questions for last and, and uh, Someone's monitoring that and, and the chat, and, and they will get, get those questions to me at the end of the presentation. And if we don't have time to get them to them all, I'll definitely be glad to answer them uh, later. So we're going to move in. So the background on free electrification in the Department of Homeland Security. Again, I mentioned our goal of 50% by 2030. That's that's a pretty pretty lofty goal, but it, it, we, we're gonna shoot for the, for the stars and hopefully we'll hit the moon. Um, DHS has a fleet of 51,000 vehicles, and of those, 20%, you know, 40% of that's administrative and 60% is law enforcement. We have the largest law enforcement um, fleet within the federal government. Um, the goal here, um, again, because, because this is the mission, we actually have to pay close attention to how law enforcement vehicles are handled. None of the law enforcement vehicles right now, uh, is, right now I'm saying the entire fleet is not electrified, but we, we are working towards it. But we have to make sure that vehicles are available that meet the law enforcement mission. Um, the fleet electrification is implementation method, DHS climate action plan, uh, the, the secretary priority action two, which is to ensure climate resilient and facilities and infrastructure. Um, we requested uh, funding for this entire effort uh, in, calendar, in fiscal year 22 for $76 million, and we received $32 million. We also received $32 million in FY23. But the, the good part about that, uh, we have a, a deputy chief readiness support officer uh, who actually actually negotiated to make sure that we had, in the first year, that money to spend over two years. You know, there's there's a lot of resistance to just jumping in full force on uh, obtaining electric vehicles and all of the things that are associated with it. We we did learn a lot through this entire process. It's not just as easy as just going to say that you're going to buy vehicles and, and put them in place. There are obstacles and there are restraints and constraints to this entire process. But again, you know, I'm going to speak to how we, we, we are going to work through them. Uh, the best way possible. Uh, my office falls under the Department of Homeland Security's Chief Readiness Support Officer. And of course, like I mentioned, our Deputy Chief Readiness Support Officer was the one that negotiated to use that uh, fiscal year 22 mon money in a 
to be expended in 22 and 23. However, the money that we received in 23, we actually have one year executed. So uh, that money is not necessarily going to the 14 components that we have um, that have vehicles and those components being like ICE, CBP, TSA, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, Secret Services, all of the different organizations. Our organization here at CRSO is primarily uh, policy and oversight. And those or, those organizations that I mentioned are all operational uh, organizations that actually perform the mission of DHS. So normally they get the money, they spend it as they see fit. However, uh, because this was a, a new effort, they wanted us to control money here at headquarters, uh, and that money would eventually go directly to those components. Um, in FY22 and 23, we're focusing on admin and support vehicles and electric vehicle supply equipment known as charging stations, other support infrastructure, test studies, and the law enforcement vehicles. So our approach, uh, and this is where we talk about what we did prior to that executive order. Remember I said the executive order from the president came out in December of 2021. We had already been working on it since January of 2020, but in July of 2021, we established a program management office, EVPMO is what we call it, Electric Vehicle Program Management Office. That's headed up by um, uh, our PMO, Janine Smith, and a deputy PMO, Ms. Uh, Toya McDuffie. Um, both of them are critical to making sure that we get this right, that we do the best that we can to electrify the, the department. Uh, originally, of course, what we were doing in 20, early 20 and part of 2021 was from a fleet management perspective. Uh, anybody that's, and I'm, and I'm not saying that, that how your organization electrifies your fleet is right or wrong. However, we found it beneficial to involve everybody that, that's going to, to take uh, part in this. Uh, we didn't just uh, limit it to the fleet management community. We have the environmental community and the facilities folks, everybody that's involved uh, in all things related to vehicles and, and their environment. So uh, you can't have electri electric vehicle supply equipment or EVSEs without the facilities folks involved, and you can't do any of this stuff without uh, uh, including your sustainability. So all of these folks are actually involved in our uh, program management office. If you can see the graphic over to the right-hand side, it, it lists CRSO, which is our organization components, industry, and GSA. And, you know, it's it's a partnership. It's not it's not just us doing this. We, we have a, a full partnership with the entire auto industry, general services administration, um, all of those uh, vehicle uh, or the components that own vehicles that I mentioned uh, and ourselves to make this work. The core principles of this entire thing is to enhance the components mission. We wanna make them, um, make it easy for them to do the job and, and give them the right tools to do the job. Avoid the transformative program to uh, face the unknown. And definitely there are some unknowns when we start talking about converting from internal combustion engines over to electric vehicles. And we also want to be the pioneer of fleet electrification and the blueprint for the government. At this point, everything that we've been doing since 2020, we do have other organizations outside of DHS reach out to us to see how DHS is doing it. Um, constant calls from Department of Justice and uh, USDA Forest Service. There's a lot of organizations that rely on the, the, the things that we've done going forward so far. We want to build a strong strategic relationship based on flexibility, transparency, collaboration with our stakeholders. And that's what part of what I just mentioned. We're not doing this in a vacuum. We're talking to people. We're sharing information. Anything that we learn, we share. If, if, we, if it works, we share. If it doesn't work, we share. We just want to make sure that we set the uh, standard going forward and anybody else can use those tools that we have uh, learned along the way and to lay the groundwork for future ownership by the components. Again, uh, right now we at CRSO, we're controlling the money. Uh, we're basically setting the cadence and the tone, but eventually that entire process is going to go back to those components that actually manage their own fleets. The major lines of effort. So we have um, 
of course, the two primary components of electric vehicles are the vehicles themselves and the electric vehicle supply equipment. We're dealing with different types of vehicles uh, within the federal government. Of course, those that are owned by those components that own them, battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid uh, electric vehicles, which is BEV and PHAV is what we have listed here, and lease vehicles. Uh, the government uh, has a, a, a large presence of lease vehicles that are provided by GSA to those organizations, uh, and GSA controls them, but we still want to work with GSA to make sure that we can get electric vehicles into the uh, inventory where possible, and shuttle buses. We've learned that shuttle buses are a good way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If you can get an electric bus versus a gas or diesel bus, that would be an optimal way or a big way to show that you're making change. Uh, electric vehicle supply equipment, the hardware, the installation. Uh, there are standalone units, uh, mobile systems, uh, solar canopy EVSCs. And when I talk about solar canopies, if you've ever been somewhere where they have a large, what they call array of solar panels in a parking lot or somewhere just off to the side, you want to leverage those solar panels to not just collect electricity for, uh, for grid use, but collect electricity uh, for charging vehicles. And then we have other supporting infrastructure that, that other projects that, that uh, uh, will enhance the electric vehicle and electric vehicle supply equipment uh, capabilities of the department. Our, our roadmap to success on this one, and it's just, just a plan and there's no guarantee that it's actually going to work this way, but we are working toward it. Uh, the goal is to put as many electric vehicle supply equipment infrastructure in as possible by fiscal year 28. Um, our current process right now is on, on purchasing and leasing is, uh, is the vehicles that are for administrative and support. Uh, and as you see, that goal goes out all the way until we get it done within FY30, which is our goal. Uh, some of the other efforts that we have are conducting tests and pilots uh, for law enforcement vehicles to see what the industry has, to see what GSA the vehicles that are available for GSA can support the law enforcement mission. Uh, right now, uh, when we say no, I mean, we are testing some vehicles and there are onesie twosies that we can put into place and have, uh, and, I, and I'll show you some examples later. But at the end of the day, right now, uh, the majority of the law enforcement fleet within the Department of Homeland Security are pickup trucks and SUVs and some sedans, but primarily pickup trucks and SUVs. And as you know, for all of the gear that's being transported by uh, law enforcement folks today, the, it, it might not necessarily be possible um, to put those into a Chevy Bolt, for instance, or a vehicle that's smaller. Um, even though those electric vehicles are available today, that doesn't mean that they meet the law enforcement mission or law enforcement requirements. And then once we go through the proof of concept and conducting those LE tests, um, we'll, we'll, we'll have determination on whether these vehicles can or cannot uh, meet the law enforcement mission. And those vehicles that do meet the law enforcement mission, as you can see in the graphic at the bottom, we plan to start making those purchases and leases to uh, increase the electric fleet of the law enforcement organizations all the way up through our uh, end goal of FY30. So our initial 22 uh, electric vehicle supply equipment requirements was to put out uh, over 45 states 1,500 planned uh, stations to provide 3,000 ports. You know, we, we say 1,500, um, uh, I say 15,000, 1,500 to provide 3,000 ports because each port, each each charging station, we, we're looking for dual port. Um, so we, we, we expect to have two two ports at each charging station. Um, and we're, we're concentrating primarily on uh, government-owned locations. There are uh, other locations where the government actually occupies um, their GSA leased, uh, GSA-owned uh, direct lease. That means direct leasing from a, a, a lessor. And then there's the, the government-owned stuff. Uh, the the, the DHS-owned compounds are where we plan to put the majority of our charging stations, primarily because we control that space. Uh, GSA actually has their own electrification uh, or EVSC process, uh, and, and they, at their facilities uh, and their lease facilities, will be managing how those charging stations get installed there. 
And this conceptual, um, the EV acquisitions, when we say EVs, we're talking about the electric vehicles themselves. Um, again, if you notice the graphic, it shows 51,000 in 2021 and goes all the way out to 2030. And as the vehicles come online, we plan to start increasing uh, more acquisitions of the electric vehicles and less acquisitions of the internal combustion engines. And as those internal combustion engines phase out, we will increase the total electric vehicle purchase. I don't know if you guys have heard, but uh, most of the auto manufacturers have also indicated that they're going to stop manufacturing internal combustion engines by a specific year. And I'll say General Motors, I'm going to say they are 2035. So as, you know, as the industry changes, as technology changes and, as, you know, the price of the batteries come down, the range of the batteries increase um, and the infrastructure is, is, is more capable of accepting electric vehicles you see as many charging stations as you see gas stations, uh, things will, will, will change immediately. So the unique challenges and adoptions of uh, adopting uh, uh, EV adoption itself, uh, the installation of uh, uh, electric vehicle supply equipment, infrastructure, and EVs. Um, the cost of a EVSE pricing is anywhere from eight to forty-six thousand dollars, and that's just to install one. Um, the goal is to install as many in one location as possible to to kind of save money. You don't want to dig several times every time you get new vehicles coming in. You want to do the digging and the conduit, all of those things that that you need to do up front, so that when the vehicles come, the charging infrastructure is already there. Um, we're trying to use a strategic uh, sourcing vehicle. The current one is the GSA Blanket Purchase Agreement, which actually has uh, all services associated with the installation of electric vehicle supply equipment, which uh, includes site assessment uh, and permits and everything that's associated with working with the uh, the um, the utilities to make sure that we're not over overdoing the grid or or changing with working with the utilities to make changes when necessary if you're going to have a, a new set of draw on you know a new pool of electricity on the grid uh, we're working with the electric vehicle oems original equipment manufacturers um, capability currently you know when you order a government order a vehicle from an auto manufacturer it takes 90 to 120 days to build um, and that's through the normal government process by either ordering them to GSA or leasing them to GSA. We, the GSA actually has to reach back to the manufacturer and say, hey, these are the orders that we have. And of course, from that point, it takes them in the 90 to 120 days to build and ship the vehicle. However, in the current climate, we're dealing with um, global chip shortages and supply chain issues. Those are improving, but right now they're still impact the delivery on vehicles. And then there's what they call OEM availability. Um, the, 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 you know, the auto manufacturers are in this for the money primarily. So they are purchasing, they're, they're, buy, they're manufacturing vehicles for the, for the uh, civilian market and the commercial market, not necessarily for the government market. Even though the government is a big player in this, we are a small player when it comes to the amount of vehicles that those OEMs sell. And then specifically to DHS and for many other law enforcement organizations, we have what they call the home to work situation where uh, an agent or officer is allowed to, to use their vehicle uh, primarily home uh, to take a vehicle home on a, on a daily basis. How will we uh, switch from using a, an internal combustion engine right, right now where they just get gas whenever they need it to making sure that they have charging capabilities in their home? Uh, so we, you know, worked with the Office of Management and Budget to get an approval of a legislative change proposal. We did that here at DHS. That legislative change proposal was not specifically for DHS, but for any federal agency. Um, we got it actually passed at the uh, 117th Congress, but right now it's being questioned again by the 118th Congress. Uh, during that that legislative change, that legislative change proposal will allow federal agencies to pay for home uh, charging installation uh, or home charging stations, the installation of those charging stations, and the electricity uh, that is used to charge those vehicles. 
So there are what we call mobile charging solutions um, that do not require digging. And we've actually worked with some of these vendors to figure out what this is and how it's going to work for us too. So mobile charging options right now, the two that the, the main one that we're currently using is the Beam EVR. Uh, the DHS procured 32 of these. And if you can see in the picture just below this, the text, it shows the vehicles under uh, a solar charging panel. Now those solar charging uh, units basically are level two charging stations that allow, uh, what, two port level two charging stations. They're low level, level two. They're not, it's not like they're attached to the grid. So they're depending on the sun to charge the vehicle. Um, the, the data associated with it actually comes from an organization called ChargePoint. So as you charge the vehicle, we'll know what vehicle is charging, how much electricity it's using, and, and so forth. Um, if you notice over in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a, a unit we have that shows Danar. That's actually a mobile charging station. It, it, it does more than just charge vehicles. That's just one of its features, but it's 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 a good capable vehicle that's used for uh, a disaster relief or or a, anywhere that you need to to do some um, some digging or some equipment lifting or some moving. But it's also a big battery on wheels, so it's capable of charging four vehicles at a time. Um, in the links for these, both of them are attached to the presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to share the presentation itself, but it's, it's going to be made available. And that way you can just click on the links and see all the capabilities of those two, two particular pieces of equipment. Uh, DHS have procured 32 of the Beam EV arcs right now. Uh, we've deployed them uh, through the Federal Law Enforcement Training Centers here in the United States at uh, Glencoe, Georgia, Artesia, uh, Cheltenham, Maryland, uh, and uh, Charleston, South Carolina, as well as uh, a location in Puerto Rico. Now, these things are wind rated at 120 miles an hour and can be stored away in a disaster. So if a hurricane's coming, you could just lower them, push them inside a building, lock them up, and when the uh, when the uh, storm has passed, you can drag them back out to wherever you had them, put them back up, and even if the electricity is not working, you still have charging capabilities. So our engagement when we talk about our partners, so we, you know, we work with uh, GSA and the OEMs. One of the, one of the things that we did early on, and, and, and me and my team, uh, Fabian Cardona. Uh, Dion Chisholm, Otoya McDuffie, and a few other folks here. We we worked with the auto manufacturers and GSA. You know, GSA is if you're working for the federal government, GSA is the point where all vehicles come from. You cannot operate without working through GSA. However, we did engage with all of the auto manufacturers because the auto manufacturers actually produce what we want. So we had discussions with them to discuss uh, what DHS requirements are uh, and to see if those vehicles are going to meet those DHS requirements. You know, we partnered with Ford, General Motors, Delon which is Fiat Chrysler, used to be Fiat Chrysler Automotive, and Tesla. We've had discussions with all of them. We've had demonstrations by all of them. Um, we know what they're manufacturing, and we know how soon they're going to be manufactured. And even though some of the vehicles may meet law enforcement requirements, we still want to make sure. Um, the electric vehicles that are capable of meeting are slated available uh, to order for GSA starting in 22. Um, other OEM dedicated electric vehicles will be coming in calendar year 24. Um, there's a few vehicles that we have listed here, so we plan to test as many as, as possible. Uh, we currently have uh, a Ford uh, F-150, or several Ford F-150s, the Explorer, which will be coming out soon, uh, the Mustang Mach-E and G Mach -E GT. Uh, we actually have a Mustang Mach-E, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Silverado, uh, by General Motors, the Equinox, the Blazer, and a Hummer pickups and SUVs. Hummer pickups and SUVs are a nice vehicle. I've actually had the opportunity to, to use, to ride one of them, and it's a good vehicle for the desert, but that price tag is a little high for the federal government. It, it looked kind of crazy for us to be purchasing vehicles that come up uh, uh, over $100,000 at a pop. Uh, the Tesla Model Y and the Tesla Model 3 are also possible uses uh, for uh, for law enforcement. They are good for support vehicles at this point. And in some cases, the General Services Administration um, has to ship uh, Model 
I think model wise, uh, primarily because the other auto manufacturers cannot be shipped to those locations. And I say Puerto Rico is one. Um, but we, we plan on testing as many as possible to meet the law enforcement requirements. The, the vehicles that are currently already available through the GSA uh, General Services Administration catalog for purchasing and lease, we're already rolling those out for, for admin and support today. But the vehicles for law enforcement, again, we're, we're testing those as we, as we go. So the LEV prototypes. You know, the plans is to con conduct these prototype tests and pilots with the components that have a law enforcement mission. Our largest components within the Department of Homeland Security that have a law enforcement mission are CBP, our Customs and Border Patrol, Federal Protective Service, uh, FPS, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and the U.S. Secret Service. Uh, and then we did leave out one, which is also Transportation Security Administration, or TSA. Um, DHS will share the pilot performance tests and results with other federal law enforcement agencies. Um, we actually, I'm actually the chair for the uh, Fleet Electrification Law Enforcement Working Group, uh, which consists of uh, us here at headquarters, uh, agents and officers from all of the agents, officers and fleet managers from all of the DHS components, as well as what we call associate members from outside LE organizations. And we have at least 20 federal agencies outside of DHS that participate in our meeting. So again, we're trying to collaborate as much as possible. We share the information. We've shared our test results so far from the one vehicle that we actually did put on the road, which is pictured below. Uh, which is the Federal Protective Services Mustang Maki. Of course, you see it's equipped with uh, light sirens, radio, and all of the other things associated with the computers, uh, radio, and all of the things that law enforcement needs. It actually has a, uh, a lockbox in the back for weapons, everything it needs. Uh, so again, as as these vehicles come online, we're gonna we're gonna test as many as possible. And just as a note, this uh, FPS is the first fully upfit law enforcement electric vehicle in the federal government, and we were able to do that. Um, we will set aside funding for uh, other pilots and, and testing and purchasing vehicles as they become available for field tests. Again, we want to prove that they work or prove that they don't work. It's not it's not a one size fits all because if, if the if the uh, if the uh, if the uh, commercial market isn't meeting our needs, we we have to hold off on electrifying, but we're trying to electrify as much as possible. So again, working with these auto manufacturers allows us to do that. Um, we had uh, this particular vehicle uh, was was tested at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center here at, uh, at Cheltenham, Maryland. Um, uh, it, it, its potential rollout can go to all of these other components that we have listed here. Uh, we took it through a high threshold testing and uh, made sure that it, it may meet the capabilities of law enforcement. So it, it, it's right now out being tested in several different zones uh, to you know, provide actual operational testing to see if it does meet the needs for the law enforcement officers. Way forward, um, right now we're executing those funds for administrative and support fleet, uh, EVSC projects and mobile charging stations. And, you know, we're working with every component within DHS to make sure that we can electrify as much as possible and, and get their input and, you know, and, 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 and put things in place to, to make this entire process um, fully operational uh, and, and make the conversion. Uh, we'll continue to meet with the OEM, as General Service Administration, to advocate for the Department of Homeland Security. One of the things that you know we've, we've done as a team over the past couple of years, of course, we're going to talk about meeting with these uh, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs. Um, they're, they're, they're hearing us. They, they, they heard us. Um, one of the things that we have found as an obstacle through this process is the amperage output or the voltage output is required for radios and computers and stuff like that. Um, well, what we found is that you know they they heard us and they're manufacturing vehicles that will meet the need. I think Chrysler is coming out with um, a vehicle that's an SUV shortly that that will meet all of our needs. I know uh, General Motors is coming out with three vehicles. Uh, two in 2024 and one in 2025. The two in 2024 police police patrol vehicles are the Equinox and the Blazer. And then the Chevy Silverado will be coming out, the Chevy Silverado police uh, patrol vehicle will be coming out in 2025. And Ford also released um, 
special service vehicle F-150 Lightning, um, which which I think will be out later this year. So and it will be and it's equipped for law enforcement. So again, they they've been listening. It's not like we've just been talking into a vacuum. Between us providing feedback to GSA who provides feedback to the OEMs and us talking with them uh, collaboratively, uh, they, they're making changes. Uh, we're hoping to develop guidance for home charging to prepare for home to work EVs. The Department of Homeland Security um, has 26,000 home to work authorizations. That doesn't mean that there's 26,000 vehicles running around out there. People are taking them home just, just as an idea of home to work uh, authorizations. It's just a piece of paper that an agent has uh, agent officer has that uh, if they need to have the vehicle used uh, taken home that they, they can uh, out of that uh, there's only eight thousand vehicles that are permanently assigned to someone that take to and from home on a quarterly basis so we're monitoring that data but we, we need to have a guidance in place on how we're going to execute this um, so we will continue with work with the components and additional candidates for vehicles for EV sites and testing locations. Again, for EVSEs, we want to put them as put out as many electric vehicle supply equipment as possible. We want to make sure that when the vehicles show up, they can charge. We don't want everybody technically what we call charging in the wild. We don't want agents and officers having to go sit at uh, a charging station at a store. Uh, and sit there for four hours to try to charge the vehicle. We want to make sure that that can be done in a closed environment or, you know, some type of controlled environment. Um, we're partnering with GSA Public Building Service, uh, an electric vehicle acquisition team or AVSC installation at GSA managed and leased sites. Um, and then we want to ensure the components have access to the GSA BPA, which we spoke of earlier, uh, for EVSC site surveys and installation of for DHS managed sites. So again, that's that's basically the entire brunt of my presentation. So basically, again, like I say, we, we just want to, I just want to give you guys an insight on how we at the Department of Homeland Security have uh, initiated and, and began our process of electrifying the fleet. It, it might not fit your organization. However, uh, it's a good blueprint if you guys want to want to want to use it. And if, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm open that right now. All right. Thank you, Eric. I am going to read some questions to you. So I've got two that are very similar. So I'm going to try and blend them together. But the basic question is, if the power grid were to go down, if if the United States is having problems with the power grid or disaster uh, natural disaster prone areas uh, where the electricity has not is knocked out for long periods of time what is the plan what would be the fallback plan for something like that so again that's that's where we're hoping to deploy as many of the uh, mobile charging stations and, and and mobile power units to to help back that up and it's the same situation if if you're driving your car today if you live in louisiana and texas and you have a hurricane and the power goes out you can't get gas either so it kind of works in a hand in hand you know so it, it, the power grid goes down if you already have gas you're good if you're already if the vehicle's already charged you're good um but again as as technology changes um so will these other things and again solar power solar solar power power solar power charging stations and mobile devices or mobile charging stations are going to help um, satisfy that need. Okay, thank you. And then the next question is, has DHS worked with the DOE Clean Cities Coalitions? Um, for example, if there are fast, this is their DC fast chargers and level two charging stations. And in this place, I think it's the, um, Rick, I don't know if you're in the Pittsburgh or, um, Philadelphia, I think you're the Pittsburgh area, um, but it's Pennsylvania. It says their local county police have a, a Mach E and a number of F 150s in service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, two things. So, DC, uh, clean cities, yeah, we worked with them in the past, but right now we're working with the Department of Energy in general on coming up with the guidelines that we need for making sure that we uh, have formulas in place and everything. We're working with uh, FAM, uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, Federal Emergency, or oh, I forgot what FEM stands for, but we're working with all of these organizations to make sure that we have in place all of the things we need to collect the proper data. Now, um, yeah, DC Clean Cities, I don't think we work with them on this particular effort though. Uh, F1, the, the, there are many law enforcement organizations that have F-150s and uh, Mach-E's and a few Teslas in place. And of course, 
doing my research in FY in calendar year 20, I reached out to many of them. I've actually talked to uh, a couple of uh, law enforcement organizations in New York in the past couple of days, uh, primarily trying to figure out how they've been doing with the Maquis and, 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 uh, and Teslas that they have in, in place. So yeah, we're working with other law enforcement organizations outside the federal government as well. Okay. And then another question is, um, are you using t the tools on the AFDC website to help you with um, and the studies of the and the pilot programs? I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with that site. Okay. All right, Rick. If you want to clarify that, um, let's see. Another question: How do you see fuel costs being tracked going forward? Right now, we track gallons purchased, costs of fill up, and any maintenance on vehicles. In place of gallons, mm -hmm. would we be looking at how much a charge is used? Yes, yes, definitely. So, in, on the government side, you know, of course, every every vehicle that comes uh, has a what they call a fleet charge card. Right now, I think they're using Wex as their card. Uh, Wex can actually today if you were to just like if you if you had if you had a personally owned uh, electric vehicle and you needed to charge it outside of your home charging you would go up to a commercial charging station and use your credit card so that credit card would should be able to capture how much electricity that they're using how long it took you to charge and all of that kind of stuff so it, all of that's going to be in part of the uh, ev tracking and i'm sure uh, the federal automotive statistic tool that is currently used that actually tracks fuel use, maintenance, and all of those other things will be tracking electricity use. Maintenance use should decrease dramatically using electric vehicles, less moving parts, um, but the, the electric, electricity use is going to go up and that will be tracked plus mileage. And then we also have telematics on the, the majority of our vehicles. So all of that information is being captured. Okay. And then the other end of the life cycle, what's the government's plan for waste recycle disposition of the batteries once they reach the end of their life? Cycle? So, so I guess we're going to have to go with the plan for the entire industry. You know, we just, just getting vehicles now, we're hoping that they're going to be around for 10 years. Uh, in 10 years, we hope that those vehicle batteries can be used for storage elsewhere. Uh, when, when you pull a battery out of an electric vehicle, a lot of vehicles, you know, it's, it's not like your, your battery out of your, your radio, I mean, uh, out of your, your, uh, your flashlight. Some people just throw them away or dispose them properly. Uh, but at the end of the day, the EV, SD, the EV batteries can be used to store uh, uh, and, and attached to other solar units. So if you attach it, that's just one method. If you attach a solar, a, a battery to a solar unit, of course, now your solar unit is more than just a solar charging station. It is actually storing electricity for you use uh, to do more things. Uh, so I think the plan is to go the, the, the route of the, the, the industry, uh, and, but, but that's soon to be figured out. We don't have all of the answers today. This this entire EV process, just for everybody's awareness, uh, it's been a learning process for everybody. It's not, it, it, it's, it's, there's no one answer right now. You know, I, I couldn't tell you how we're planning, how the federal government as a whole is going to dispose of electric vehicle batteries. Uh, we, we, we only have a couple of electric, or a few electric vehicles in the inventory right now. So as they get disposed, and especially those that are leased, uh, the GSA. I'm not. I don't know how GSA is going to do it. I'm sure GSA normally sells their vehicles through their regular auction process. But those own vehicles that we have in the federal government, we have the same excess. Pro we have an excess process or an exchange sale process where we dispose of a vehicle, it gets auctioned off, and uh, you know, and, and it goes to a commercial person or, or somebody buys it. So I, I don't know if we're going to get into the disposal actually of uh, auto batteries the same way that we would a, a computer. So we dispose of computers, so we dispose of phones, we dispose of other things, but the government normally, uh, well, we, here in DHS, we normally go through the exchange sale process. When we auction a vehicle off, it goes to a, 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 a private buyer, uh, and we use that money to buy more vehicles. Okay. Another question, how are you aptly planning for the life rates and replacement costs for solar panels, battery replacements, hazardous reclamation, et cetera? Are there TCO studies being collected? So that's our environmental folks. I'm a fleet guy. <laughs> I, can't, I can't answer to that. <laughs> All right. Um, 
is the plan to beef up the power producing technologies prior to having this presidential order take full effect? So, beef up, what is it now? Uh, are, is the plan to beef up the power producing technologies before the order takes full effect? Or is it kind of happening no. simultaneously? I think I think it's happening simul simultaneously because you know there's there's things that we can control within the federal government, but there's things that we cannot control. We have to work with the utilities where necessary. If we're going to install a lot of charging stations and a lot of vehicles are going to be in one place to be charged, we have to work directly with the utilities to make sure that they uh, do whatever they need to do to the grid to make sure that we're not we're not excessively drawn on the grid or impacting everybody else that lives in that grid. So we, we have to work with those utilities when necessary to make that happen. Okay. Um, next question. Any plans to accommodate new technologies such as hydrogen fuel cells? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's the, I, I will say that when, when that technology is a bit, I actually do I actually have Hydrogen and and uh, fuel cell technologies, I do think, will be a, a strong competitor against the electric vehicle market, but the electric vehicle market is today. Okay. And then uh, Connie Aaron is in here um, with the um, two things. She said you did a, it's a great presentation. And then the second thing is the AFDC is the Alternative Fuels Data Center. So there's a website. Okay. okay. I'm taking note of that. Okay. And it's uh, the and we'll research it. Okay. And it's through the National Renewable Labs. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, we work with we work with NREL. NREL actually assisted us to come up with our fleet electrification plan uh, when we first started this back in 2020. Um, so we work with NREL, Idaho National Labs, and a few other organizations. Um, the, like I say, FEMP, just to make sure uh, that we're doing the right thing. And of course, we, we, we rely on their on their research and expertise. All right, terrific. And then some of this was coming from Rick Price, who's the executive director of Pittsburgh Region Clean City. So I knew it was somewhere in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I have a follow-up question for you. Um, there was an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> to expand on your answer, do you have any recommendations on how to start tracking are charging. And then Carrie goes on to say, to my knowledge, the state does not currently have requirements in place for electric vehicles. So we're with no, they, they, they do not. Again, so so tracking, you know, just like your cell phone, you have to have a carrier. You can't you 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 can try to figure out on your own, but you know, there's organizations that when you plug in a vehicle, they pull the vehicle's data. They they pull how much is being done. So you have to subscribe to an organization that does that. I just throw out one name, which is ChargePoint. There are others, um, but but ChargePoint actually monitors that, just like your cell phone provider monitors everything that you do. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, so that is the end of the questions. Let me. We'll give them thirty seconds um, to I see. see if uh, uh, Lisa, I have a. I have a question if I could ask. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, so, Eric, I, I just, um, first of all, thank you for sharing those links to like the, the Danner uh, website and, and the current group that you're using. It's really, really neat technology, actually. The, the uh, <clears throat> ability to have like an electric vehicle kind of automated on wheels and a battery come to you or something is really kind of neat. Um, I, I had a question and, 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 and this may need to be like maybe a follow on presentation or something, but I was just curious if you could share a little bit about your and your experience so far. You're, you're working now in developing a, uh, a process in a new space, constantly evolving space of electric vehicles. Uh, you mentioned that there's some vehicles coming out in 2025 that'll be able to support some of the um, uh, requirements for for police officers. Uh, and, and kind of, or not police, but uh, well, yeah, law enforcement. Law enforcement, yeah. Uh, but what what has it been like? So, uh, could you just share a few few thoughts on on kind of your experience so far, kind of working with all of these different groups, and um, in a new in a new space that changes literally almost probably daily with what they're able to do. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, good question. Again, 
you don't, one of one of my favorite lines, and, and I'm sure some of my team members are on the phone have heard me say this a hundred times. You don't know what you don't know, right? So you you may have lofty ideas on what you plan to do, and then you get a big smack in the face with a wet mop that says, "Hey, you can't do that." Uh, we 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 have challenges. I mean, and it's not easy. Again, one of the things I've I've said, you can't just grab a bunch of electric vehicles and throw them out there and hope it works. You got to do some planning. Um, coming from the fleet side uh, and the, and the, with the fleet approach that I originally had in 2020, it wasn't going to work. I mean, even though we tried, we had ideas of, of, of how it was going to work. We were just going to grab a vehicle, throw some lights and sirens on it, put it to work. We know it's fast out the blocks already, so what's the problem? But the problem is it doesn't work for the law enforcement folks. You have to get their input. So, uh, again, when, when we started the PMO in 2020, 21, I was a little salty at first. I'm like, wait a minute now, what are, what are you guys doing? At the end of the day, they were a godsend because they were able to collaborate and bring all of these different organizations together. Um, a lot of the things that we do, um, we can't do in a silo, even though we, we think that this is our business line and, and we're experts. Yeah, we may be experts within that business line, but in certain things, we don't consider all of the other things that are associated to get that mission complete. Um, again, uh, in, in my experience, anybody that chooses to go the electrification route, don't look at it as a fleet management thing, look at it as a holistic thing, include everybody. And this is one one of the most vital lessons that I, I, I will take away from this, include everybody that you think needs to be involved. They will fall out if they're not involved, if they don't have to, but include everybody in the beginning. If I had included the environmental folks and the facilities folks when I first started this, we might've been further along. But at the end of the day, the bringing on and creating the program management office was the right thing to do when we did it because of the volume of stuff that we're going to do, the volume that we're trying to tackle, the amount of facilities that we're trying to impact with EVSEs, all of those different things. And the environmental folks have to be tied directly into that because they know what they need to keep control of so that we don't you know, go off the rails. So again, my experience is just to make sure that you collaborate early and often. Thank you. Yeah, it, it would be um, kind of neat to maybe have a follow on in the next uh, couple of years as you get, you know, further along and, and everything. Sure. Goes, it's, that it's would, I really would actually look forward to that. Awesome. Thank you. We, and we had one another question come in one more. It, you mentioned large storage, Eric. Do you have any special requirements in case of an electrical fire? So electrical fires, that, that's been a question that's come up often. So that's something that's not a that's not a DHS specific question or, or EV specific question as it pertains to the federal government. This is something that pertains to the industry and how commercial manufacturers are working with the fire departments across the country. Um, that that it's it's a big thing because you want to make any, any anybody involved with touching other than operating uh, an electric vehicle has to be qualified in high voltage. And because of the, the, the material and the battery, uh, how they extinguish it is special as well. So I, I think the auto manufacturers have been, you know, th that, that question has come up often, um, but primarily it, it, it has to be answered by the auto manufacturers working with the fire departments. And they have been working with the fire departments extensively. I, I know there are a few electric vehicles that have caught fire on the highway. Um, you don't hear about it as much as often as you did early on when Tesla was melting vehicles on the side of the road, primarily because the fire departments didn't know how to put out the fire. I think I think I think everybody is is involved in, in that standard of, of what the battery is made of is, is is known to the to the fire departments across the country. And I think they have worked to have all of the apparatus they need. So when they know when they when they know that there's an electric vehicle involved in an accident, they know what to bring. All right, thank you. Just um I don't see any more questions, so just a little housekeeping. If uh, I will make these presentations available at npma.org, but the fastest way for you to get a hold of the presentation slides, if you'd like them, is to email education at npma.org um, and just request those slides. CEUs for this, the CEU that you're issued will be 
on your profile if you are an NPMA active member. It will be on your My Learning profile um, sometime in early April. And I think that's it. That I think that's it for the housekeeping. Scott, did you have anything? I, I just had one other thing. Please join us again uh, next week for our fourth session of the month. Um, and that's going to be presented by Yvonne Batcher. Um, and she'll be talking about the essential aspects and keys to success in a diverse work environment. So if you're interested, certainly check that out. Otherwise, I'd love to thank Eric uh, for, for his time and, and presentation today. I have a little bit of homework looking up some of the uh, the items that we talked about, not not having a little bit of a fleet background. But um, <laughs> Eric, uh, thank you. And, and I would really, um, I am I am going to make a note here, and, and hopefully Lisa can too. I, I'd really love to to hear from you in, a, in, in, a, in like another year or two um, as you get further involved in here and about your experiences in the whole whole process is pretty neat. well you guys you guys got my contact information if anybody in on on the uh on the webinar has any questions feel free to shoot me an email let me know what you what you need i'll try to answer it the best i can if not i'll find an answer uh again i i'll be uh it will be my honor to come back in a couple of years and tell you guys how we've done so far uh and i'm looking forward to it that would be great. awesome thank you thank you very much all right bye everyone Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm going to close this now, and hopefully we will see you next week.